Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. Check us out on Twitter at Radio Detectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. A reminder, as you're making your travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com first. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate link, so if you make a purchase through that link, part of the purchase price supports the Great Detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Well, now it is time for the conclusion of this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar serial. The original air date, September 5th, 6th, and 7th, 1956, and it's the Curse of Kamashek Matter, episodes 3 through 5. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the operator at the Explorers Club. Oh, good. Have you been able to... Sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I haven't been able to reach Mr. Donald Cronin for you. Well, hasn't he been there at all? He was in and out all morning, but he refused to answer any calls then. Since you first telephoned, he hasn't been back. Well, do you know when he will be back? No, I don't, sir. All right, then leave a message. I'll meet him there at the club. Is it very important that you see him, Mr. Dollar? It's important that I keep him from being murdered. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item six, $9.80, train to New York, quick lunch and taxi to the Traders Bank and Trust Company. There I picked up the American Express traveler's checks that Eric Turnbull had left in my name, had left for expense money to take me to Egypt, to make sure his nephew Donald Cronin lived safely through an expedition to open the grave of the ancient pharaoh Kamashek. The bank teller's brief remark gave me something to think about. Mm, I'll, uh, I'll sign, Mr. Dollar? Mm, yep. Yes, now, let me check the amount for you just once more. All right. One thousand, two thousand, three thousand, thirty-five hundred, four, forty-five, forty-seven, forty-eight, and five thousand dollars even. Mm-hmm. Yes, here you are. Good, thanks. And as I'm sure Mr. Turnbull knows, this will close out this particular account completely. I thought about that remark a little later when it began to tie in with some other things I learned. Right now, item 780 cents cab fare to the Explorers Club. Donald had not yet returned, so I left another message for him, asking him to sit tight until he heard from me. And I meant sit tight. Because apparently, after the latest argument with his Uncle Eric, he was quite likely to hop off to Egypt on short notice. This I didn't want. As a matter of fact, at this point, I wasn't sure I approved of his expedition at all. Both his uncle and his girlfriend, Dorothy Harkness, had told me they thought his life was in danger. And each accused the other of plotting his murder. I was about to leave the Explorers Club when I was buttonholed by a short, kind of cute-looking old character in 
Gray striped suit, tattersall vest, spats, believe it or not, and all but a monocle. Uh, I, I say there, old man. Uh, yes? If you'll pardon me, I believe I overheard you inquiring at the desk for Donald Cronin, didn't I? Oh, yes. Do you know him? Oh, I most certainly do. Uh, but excuse me, I'm Percival Thronghurst Scatterday. Mr. Scatterday, I'm Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Donald told me that he'd met you at his home. Uh, tell me, do you plan to accompany him on the ex expedition to Thebes? Well, uh, yes. Excellent, excellent. It should result, you know, in one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. Think of it. The tomb of Kamashek. Yes. Do you know where Donald is now? Treasures, artifacts, and that should put to shame the ones that were excavated from the tomb of Tutankhamun. Yes, I'm sure it will, but now... Uh, if history has told us the truth about Kamashek, uh, 18th dynasty, I believe... Well, that I wouldn't know, but now, uh, Mr. Scanner, today, it's important that I reach Donald Cronin just uh, as no, soon no, as... No, 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 no. Now that I think of it, Kamash... Kamashek was 12th dynasty. Oh, Mr. Scanaday. Uh, uh, but, but he couldn't be because that was the era. Oh, oh, yes, yes, I remember now. It was the 18th, the same period in which the great temple of Queen Hatshepsut was erected at Daya el Bahari at Thebes, of course. Uh, you've seen that, of course. No, I haven't. Oh, magnificent, enthralling. Now, look here, sir. Uh, but now, Mr. Dollar. I've got to reach Donald Cronin, so if you'll excuse me. Uh, Mr. Dollar, please. You say you are going with Donald. You do know about the curse of Kamashek. Or do you? Yes, yes, I've heard of it. Oh, then you'll certainly arrange not to be present at the opening of the sarcophagus. Why? Well, as I'm certain you know, all the preliminary work has been accomplished by the advance party, of course. So I understand. Uh, the antechamber of the tomb was opened over a month ago. So? Well, it simply means that as soon as Donald arrives, they will penetrate to the sepulchral chamber and the sarcophagus itself. Well? Uh, Mr. Dollar. It was engraved on the stone slab, barring the way to the last chamber, Mantak Ko Fore El, and so on. Oh, what's that supposed to be? Uh, the warning, my boy, the warning, that whosoever violate the tomb and desecrate the body of the noble pharaoh by contact therewith shall quickly die. <laughs> you don't believe in those things, do you? Mr. Dollar. As I always understood it, those warnings were just put there to discourage thieves from robbing those old tombs. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I only ask that you remember what happened to those who violated the tomb of Tutankhamun. Oh, well, couldn't the deaths of the people who entered that tomb be due simply to coincidence? Or rather, things, uh, circumstances quite apart from their having done so? Of course, of course, they could, but were they? Mr. Dollar, I assure you that if it were not for the warning of the curse of Kamashek, I would be the first to want to enter that tomb. Instead, I have refused to go on the expedition at all. Uh, take care of Donald. Well, that's what I'm being hired to do. And of yourself, sir. Yeah, sure. Now, sorry, but I'm anxious to reach Donald, and you say you've seen him here at the club? Yes, only last evening. He was here making some of his final preparations. Well, do you know where he is now? Yes. Well, where? At his uncle's place in Stamford, Connecticut. You're sure? Uh, as sure as I am that you've not heeded my warning about the curse of Kamashek. But I beg you, Mr. Dollar, for the welfare of Donald Cronin and yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. If this were a mystery story instead of an accounting of expenditures on a case, I'd tag Percy Scatterday as a prime suspect for whatever might happen later. Like the man who tries to throw you off his own trail by suggesting that somebody else is gunning for you. But I decided he was just an old fogey who'd been turned down on the Kamashek expedition was trying to justify his own shortcomings with the tales about the curse. But you know something? I was wrong. I should have listened to him a little more understandingly. <laughs> Item 8, 75 cents, taxi to the office of Harrison and Dillman and Company to see David Wilt, the man Eric Turnbull had named as his stockbroker. The reason? The remark the bank teller had made about closing out an account... As it turned out, my timing was perfect. Uh, sit down, sir, sit down. I'll be with you just as soon as I finish this phone call. Oh, sure, thanks. Hello. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, but someone just stepped into my office. If you'd rather be left alone, I'll... No, it's all right. Now, as I started to say, if you dispose of the gold metal mining stock, your holdings will be reduced to practically nothing. Yes. Yes, that's right. Well, but, Mr... Yes, but Mr. Tur... Look, you sure you wouldn't rather I can come back another time? Very well, very well. It's just that I hate to see what was once a very strong investment program. Very well, Mr. Turnbull, if you insist. Turnbull? Yes, yes. Goodbye. Now, now, sir. Eric Turnbull, Mr. Wilt? Oh, yes, but... Now, just a minute, sir. It was very remiss of me to mention a client's name in front of you, at least under the circumstances... Whatever I may have said on the phone just now was quite confidential. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I can only ask that you discreetly forget anything you may have heard. Not by a long shot. What's this? 
Who are you, sir? Dollar, I believe, the receptionist said. That's right, Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. And that conversation told me just what I came here to try to charm you into telling me. Mr. Dollar, please remember this. That was entirely confidential. None of your business. Here, my credentials. Yeah? Well? Now, you remember something. So far as Eric Turnbull is concerned, my coming here is entirely confidential. None of his business. Goodbye, Mr. Wilt. So the wealthy Eric Turnbull wasn't so wealthy after all. Big investments in the stock market, he'd said. But they didn't look so big anymore. And the closing out of bank accounts. Item 930 cents, phone call to Dorothy Harkness. Yes, Mr. Dollar? I just called to tell you, Dorothy, that if it'll be any satisfaction to you, I'm going to make the trip to Egypt. Oh, thank heaven. Then Donald will have some protection against the machinations of his uncle. Oh, gal, that sounds like a line out of an old melodrama. I know you don't believe me. Dollar, but I'm so sure that Eric Turnbull is plotting against Donald's life. You know something? I'm beginning to feel a little that way, too. Then you did believe me. In spite of the way you poo-pooed everything I said, are you... are you and Donald leaving together? I can't seem to find him. Do you know where he is? Have you tried the explorers? No, not there. Well, he'll surely call me before he leaves. Well, if he does, have him get in touch with me. Where, Mr. Dollar? Right now, I'm going out to Eric Turnbull's house. After that, I'll be back in Hartford. Item 10, $7 even, train fare back to Stamford and taxi to the Turnbull residence in the hope that there I would find Donald Cronin, the real principal in this case, and the one person I hadn't yet talked to. But it was Eric Turnbull who met me at the door. Mr. Dollar, I'm glad to see you. Come in, come in. Have you seen my nephew Donald? Well, no. Isn't he here? No, nor is he at the Explorers Club. I've called him several times. I'm worried about him in his present frame of mind. I'm worried about him too, Mr. Turnbull, but not for the same because reason. Because of that girl, Dorothy Harkness. Here, sit down. No, that isn't what I meant. In his present frame of mind, he's likely to jump off on his flight to Egypt without... Look here. I wonder if he's with her. No, that much I do know. Oh, I wish to heaven he would call if anything happens if to If anything that... happens to him, you'd love it, wouldn't you? What? What did you say? I've done a little checking up on you, Mr. Turnbull, since I last talked to you. What do you mean? In a case as involved as this, it's necessary to check all the angles. Everything, everyone, even the man who hires you. Has that girl been poisoning your mind against me, too? Your banker, from whom I picked up the American Express checks, let it slip that your account is in pretty bad shape. Non-existent now, as a matter of fact. Go on, Mr. Dollar. And your stockbroker, quite inadvertently, made it all too plain that the big investments you told me about aren't so big after all. Mr. Dollar... All right, tie that in with the fact that if anything does happen to Donald, you'll come into his estate. You've said enough. But it's true, isn't it? You laid so much stress on Dorothy and the museum getting his 100,000 life insurance, but you're the one who would really benefit by his death. Dollar, you have talked with one banker, with one stockbroker. Why, in your snooping around, didn't you talk with the others who hold my accounts? Like who? Like, that's none of your business. But if what you are implying were true, why in heaven's name would I ever ask you to come in and protect my nephew? As a cover-up? I should knock you down with my bare fists, and believe me, my boy, I could do it. Now listen to me. I'm listening. If I didn't have any money, how could I afford to give you the 5000 in expense money, pay whatever other costs may be involved in your employment? And why do you suppose, in spite of this high-handed attitude of yours, I'm still begging you to stay on this case? See, Donald, Mr. Dollar, talk with him. You'll find that in spite of the angry scene between us, I'm concerned only with his welfare, that I want to protect him, that I want you to protect him. Wait, wait, that's Donald. Now, let me take it. Well, now, just a minute. Johnny Dollar. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, I was calling Mr. Turnbull. Mr. Scannady? Uh, yes, at the Explorers Club. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I've just talked to a couple of fellow members who saw him off. Saw him? Donald Cronin? Yes, last night. His plane has probably reached Cairo by now. Uh, fooled all of us, didn't he? Yeah. Thanks. Well, thought you'd want to... Well? Donald left for Egypt last night. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Then please, please, I beg of you, go. In heaven's name, go to him. Stay with him. Protect him. For a long moment, Eric Turnbull simply stood there, sobbing pleading with his tear-filled eyes. And suddenly, I don't know why, I found that I believed him. I wish now that he'd been lying. Two lives might have been saved.
Johnny Dollar. Have you found Donald yet, Mr. Dollar? Have you been... Oh, this is Dorothy Hargman. Yeah, I know. And no, I haven't found Donald Cronin. He wasn't at his uncle's place? Johnny, you must find him. Talk to him. Talk him out of making the trip to Egypt. Dorothy. If he does, he'll die. His uncle will see to it that he dies. Look, Dorothy. You must find him and stop him. I'm afraid it's a little late for that. What? He took off on a direct flight to Egypt early yesterday. Oh, no. Has at least a 36-hour start, at least. Johnny, you must go after him. On the first plane, I can get to Cairo. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. (laughs) Item 10, taxi, train to New York and cab to the airport, $9.45. Item 11, round trip plane fare to Cairo, Egypt, $1,305. I was tired, and the steady drone of the four powerful engines lulled me to sleep in no time. I think I might have slept most of the way to Paris, which was to be our first stop, except for hunger pangs and the appropriate ministrations of a very attractive stewardess. Usually on such a long flight, I try to make friends with everybody aboard, just to shorten the trip. And I did this time, except for one man who sat four or five seats behind me. He was a rather hefty individual, dark-complexioned, about 30, I'd guess, who didn't budge from his seat during the entire flight. And every time I approached him to pass the time of day, he immediately made like he was asleep. So he wanted to be alone. But when I settled down into my seat, next to a lovely petite brunette named Carolyn, who was... Now, that's beside the point, except for purely personal reasons that I'll pursue further when I get back to the States. Uh, Yeah. The point is that in primping a bit and replenishing her lipstick, she held up a small mirror compact... And reflected in it, I could see that the dark complexion man was not only quite wide awake, but watching me every second of the ride. In a rather strange way, too. Concentrated. Like you'd watch a fly you're planning to swat. Then every time I'd turn around, he'd promptly shut his eyes and feign sleep again. Finally, it was early evening, we sat down at Le Bourget, the airport on the outskirts of Paris. Since this was Carolyn's destination, during the short layover, I helped her get her baggage and extracted the promise of a date in New York when she returned in the fall. Yeah. Yeah, I guess Paris does it to you. Well, anyhow, after she piled into a taxi, I wandered around for a bit thinking and decided to reboard the plane, look up the dark, silent passenger and have it out with him. But apparently I'd waited too long. As I passed a narrow sort of alley beside a baggage shed, he decided to have it out with me. In here, Dollar, quick. Huh? What? In here, where we won't be sane. Oh, now, just a minute, fella. Who are you? What do you want? Just this. What? No, what this you? Is... You don't. <laughs> All right, now. Now, what was the big idea, mister? You gonna talk or do you want some more of this? All right. All right, I'll talk. Well, who put you up to this? Come on, no, come on. No, I can't tell you that. You want to bet? <laughs> All right, now, start talking. I said... All right, right, I'll talk, I'll talk. It was Turnblow. It was Turnblow. What? Turnbull? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Frederick Turnbull. Why? Oh, should I know? I I do a lot of strong arm for him. Go on, go on. So he pays me good to get you out of the way, so I should ask questions? Well, maybe he'll have a few to ask you if you ever get back to the States, and I'll roll over. Huh? Hey. All right. Yeah, hey, wait. What are you doing? That's right. That's my passport. That's right, mister. That's exactly what it was. When you get back on your feet, you can try to figure out how to go on from here without it. Listen, you dirty... Sorry, m- buddy. I gotta catch a plate. <laughs> I suppose I should have turned the unfriendly thug over to the French police, but figured he'd have trouble enough lacking a passport to keep him out of my way for a while. The only charges I could make against him would be for assault. Time was of the essence, too since Donald Cronin actually was two days ahead of me and it was important that I join him at the tomb of Kamashek as soon as possible. 
At least so I thought. Until I entered the main building of the airport again and heard my name being called on the PA system. The information desk showed me where to take a transatlantic phone call. Johnny Dollar. Dollar, this is Eric Turnbull. Well, well. Thank goodness I was able to reach you during your power stopover. I'm glad you did, Mr. Turnbull, because there are a couple of things I want to talk to you about. When you uh, return, Mr. Dollar. What's the matter with right now? And may I suggest that you take the first plane back here that you can get? First, I want a little explanation for a beating I just took from... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you say? Uh, come back here and we'll settle our accounts. The, the, the case is closed. The... What? Donald is dead. Where? How? I just received word from one of the members of the expedition. In Egypt? Yes, the, the curse of Kavashek has been fulfilled. Or was he murdered? I'm afraid it was the same mysterious death that's overtaken so many who have violated those old tombs. Well, I don't believe it. Any more than you believe in that so-called curse the last time I talked to you. I know. I was wrong. Heaven forgive me for letting the boy go. Look, Mr. Turnbull, things just don't make sense at all. Come back, Mr. Dollar, and we'll talk about it here. Listen to me. Yes? Before I decide what I'm going to do, I want to know why you hired a thug to try to put me out of the picture. What? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't. Well, he made it plenty plain that he's handled strong-arm jobs for you before. That's him. Gave me your name as the man who's hired him many times. Frederick Turn... Whoa. Hold it. Hold it a minute. Dollar, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I haven't the least... Maybe time. I will go back to New York at that. Mr. Dollar! It suddenly dawned on me that I must have been slightly befuddled by the partial beating I'd taken earlier. You know, when the thug made his little confession a few minutes before. I'll talk, I'll talk. It was Turnblow hired me. Frederick Turnblow. Frederick Turnblow, he'd said, instead of Eric Turnbull. Sure, they sound alike. But a guy who's done a lot of strong-arm jobs, knows the guy, the right name of the guy that hired him, that can mean only one thing. Someone had instructed that thug to say he'd been hired by Turnbull. But who? I canceled out the rest of my flight to Cairo, made reservations back to New York, and then while waiting for that plane, ran up item 13, $82 American. On phone calls to whomever I could dig up among the Egyptian government authorities who had been overseeing the excavation of Kamashek's tomb. What little I learned was pretty much summed up by the British doctor who'd been a member of the expedition. Very mysterious, Mr. Dollar. You see, because of the superstition about violating the tomb, only two of our people even touched any of the bones we found within it. Yeah? And incidentally, that is all we found. The tomb had been thoroughly ransacked by thieves, well, probably centuries ago. Yeah, but you were saying, Doctor. Oh, yes, yes. Only two touched any of the remains. One was a native carrier, as soon as the bones had been properly sprayed, where they preserved it. Uh-huh. And the other was Donald Cronin, who, for some reason or other, wrapped up the bones and sent them by air to his uncle, a uh, Mr. Eric Turnbull in the United States. Oh. Well, go on, go on. Well, that's really all, Mr. Dollar. Except, of course, that both of them have died of some strange malady that the authorities have not been able to determine. And that's why the tomb has been officially closed again. Hey, listen, tell me something. Could the bones have been accessible to anyone before those two touched them? Yes, to anyone in the party. Well, now, don't tell me that you suspect... Oh, listen, mister, I don't know what I suspect. But I don't believe it was any curse of a long-dead pharaoh that killed those two men. Even in view of what happened to those who entered the tomb of Tutankhamen for some years ago, and then the tomb of... King... Look, tell me this, will you? Have any of the expedition returned to America? Well, of course, the authorities have here no reason for holding them. You haven't answered my question. No. Well, only the two young men that Donald brought along with him... Who were they? Uh, Carl Fortina. Oh, who's he? From New York. Like Donald himself, he's an archaeologist. And the other? One of his colleagues at the museum in, uh... Hmm, I, I believe it's in Stamford. What's his name? Oh, he's a young osteological expert, son of a curator at the museum, as I recall. What? As his name is Walter Harkness. Well, I'll be. But surely you don't think... Doctor, it's... you go right ahead and hang those two deaths on good old King Kamashek. Me? I'm going after a couple of live suspects. <laughs> There was plenty of time before the New York plane for a quick look for my heavy-handed pal in the alley where I'd left him. 
But he'd either crawled away or been picked up by the gendarmes, and I didn't have time for a session with them. Item 14, 150 for some food. Then aboard the plane, and we took off. Ah, it was a rough case to figure. Actually, of course, the insurance angle was done and over with. It ended with Donald Cronin's death. And two people would benefit by his death, both of them number one suspects. One, his uncle, Eric Turnbull, who would now take over the million-dollar estate. The other, Dorothy Harkness, who would gain a big chunk of life insurance money, along with the museum, of course, that her father... Who hold everything? Her father, Adam Harkness, who opposed her marriage to Donald, who looked on him simply as a source of income for the museum, who... Hold everything is right. There was the son, too, Walter Harkness, who ducked back to the States the minute Donald died. How did he fit into this? Believe me, in spite of all the talk in it, the belief in it, the one thing I was sure had nothing to do with the whole matter was the curse of Kamashek. Nevertheless, call it hunch or whatever you like, the more I thought about it, the more certain I became that I'd find all the answers in a package that Donald had mailed back to the States. A package containing the bones of Pharaoh Kamashek. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Haskins. Mr. Turnbull, then? Yes, and I'm sure he wishes to see you. It's a frightful thing about Master Donald, isn't it, sir? And how does Mr. Turnbull feel about it? Terribly broken up, sir. I'll bet. Oh, but, but please come in. He's in the library. Thanks. He just received a package the poor boy sent to him before he... Wait, Haskins. Has he opened it yet? He was examining the contents when the doorbell... Good heavens. Mr. Turnbull... He's fallen from his chair, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar, he's... Oh, no. Yeah, Haskins. He's dead. Johnny Dollar. Dr. St. Clair returning your call, Stinky. Oh, hi, Leonard. Where have you been, Johnny? It's been years. Yeah, I know. Listen, can you give me a hand? Who got poison this time? Two of them. I hope it's poison, and that you can prove it for me. We'll try. What do I do? Meet me here at the home of Eric Turnbull in Stamford, Connecticut. Okay, but Johnny... Give you the address in a minute. But Johnny, what do you mean you hope somebody got poison? Because if they didn't, I'm going to go off my rocker. What? Because the only other possible cause of death could be a curse. The curse of Kamashek. Who? An Egyptian king who died a couple of dozen centuries ago. What? Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. I called Dr. Leonard St. Clair, an old school chum, because I knew him to be one of the foremost toxicologists in the country. And I was telling the truth. I hoped it could be shown that some kind of poison killed Donald Cronin and subsequently his uncle, Eric Turnbull. Both, apparently, had believed in the curse of the old Egyptian pharaoh. A curse that was to befall anyone who violated his ancient tomb on the banks of the Nile. Donald had done this in excavating the tomb. But his uncle here in Stamford had only touched the bones that Donald had airmailed to him. He was opening the package that Master Donald... God rest his soul. That Master Donald had sent him just before he died, there at the tomb in Egypt. I brought them in here to the library for him, sir. Go on, Haskins. Well, then you rang the doorbell. I, I left him with it, and uh, when you and I came in here... Yeah, dead. From the curse of Gamashek, Mr. Dollar... Oh, no, Haskins, I don't believe it. A friend of mine, Dr. St. Clair, will be here shortly, and he'll be but able to... But shouldn't we notify the police? No, sir? no, no, later. But, but leave my poor employee's body just lying there? For the time being, yes. Until Dr. St. Clair examines it. Eh? As you wish, sir. That's what I wish. Haskins. 
one person in this confusing mess I hadn't given a second thought to. As it turned out, there wasn't time, for Len St. Clair arrived a few minutes later in a car equipped like a miniature laboratory. No doubt as a result of the police work he was frequently called on to do. First, of course, in his capacity as an M.D., he made a thorough examination of Eric Turnbull's body for purposes of death certificate data. This boy isn't all right, Johnny. I'm sure of it. At least as sure as I can be, short of making an autopsy. But what kind of poison, Len? And how administered? Well, at the risk of making it sound like a dime novel, I'd say it was an extremely rare, uh, well... Well, what? Come on. Well, it's something I haven't heard of in years. Related to the old Indian arrow poison. It's very difficult to detect. Can you make sure? Yes, if you'll help me drag some of my equipment in from the car, including a cage of white mice. What? Yeah, on which to experiment with samples of the stuff. Samples from those old bones out of the tomb? Mm, That's right. Now, from what you've told me, only two people have touched the bones since the minute they were discovered in the tomb. Three. A native carrier, Donald Cronin, and now the late Eric Turnbull. And they've all died. But, Johnny... Yeah? The poison I'm thinking of would hardly have been put on those bones in the time of the pharaohs. Oh, and by the way, I hope no one's touched them here. No, I've left them just as they are in that mailing wrapper. Good. Because it could be fatal. I'll carefully scrape them when we get the equipment in here. We brought in what Len needed for his work, including the white mice. Then I closed him in the library and left him to his experiments. To a bit of research, too, for he'd brought in a couple of thick books on toxicology. As a matter of routine, I phoned the local coroner and then tried to reach Dorothy Harkness. Her number didn't answer. I was about to drive over to her little apartment when Len came out of the library. I was right, Johnny. Curaba arsenium. Is that the name of the stuff? Uh-huh. In its powder form, absorbed into the pores of the skin, it could be fatal almost immediately. And listen to me. Yeah? Somehow, between the time the bones of that old king were discovered and the time that Donald Cronin touched them, somebody put that poison on them. How? Without endangering himself. By keeping it in aqueous solution until the bones were sprayed with it. Sprayed with it? Wait a minute. Yeah? Sprayed with it, huh? A doctor, an Englishman who was on the expedition, told me that the bones had been sprayed with some kind of preservative, even before the native carrier touched them. You thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, right. Instead of preservative, it was the poison. Well, who sprayed them? I've got a wild idea, Len. But if it's right, it'll sew up this whole case. I wonder who that is. Well, while you're finding out, I'm going back and recheck these tests. But only as a matter of routine, because I'm sure I'm right. I beg your pardon, sir. Yeah, Haskins? Miss Dorothy Harkness is here, sir. Huh? And her young brother, Walter. Shall I ask them in, sir? By all yeah, means. a terrible thing that has happened. Is that really the way you feel about it, Dorothy? What? Yes, just what do you mean by that, Mr. Dollar? I'm Walter Harkness. Well, come right in, Walter. Because I have a sneaking suspicion you're the boy I've been looking for. What? Your conscience finally begin to hurt you? Would you like to sit down and write your confession now? What are you talking about? Or did you and Dorothy just come here to put on a front? You know, as a cover-up? I don't know what you're talking about. Johnny, what are you saying? Sit down, both of you, because I'm going to be saying plenty. Look here, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, I said. Now sit down. All right, Dorothy, we'll begin with you. Johnny, I don't understand. Now listen to me. From what you told me, and I've no other reason for believing it except that you told me, Donald Cronin was in love with you. It was true. And I At any rate, not... he made you part beneficiary of his $100,000 life insurance policy. Half of it, I believe. A cool $50,000. Charlie, how can you say you're even Oh, think... be quiet. Mr. Dollar, I'm coming I... to you right now, Walter. You're working for the museum where your father is curator of archaeology. The museum that has depended quite a lot not only on Donald Cronin's scientific contributions... But his monetary help as well. Well, that may be true, but now look here. The museum. The other beneficiary of Donald's insurance. Also $50,000. Mr. Dollar, if you're implying that I had anything to do with Donald's death... You can shut up, too, and let me talk. This is the first chance I've had to begin to tie this case up. The first time any of the crazy elements in it made sense. No, wait, tell me this. Eric Turnbull was opposed to Donald's interest in the museum, wasn't he? Well, yes, Sure. And I'll bet my bottom dollar that if something happened to both Donald and his uncle, the estate worth nearly a million was willed by Donald to the museum. That's true, Johnny, but there's no... No wonder Eric Turnbull was afraid for Donald's life. Because he knew who would ultimately benefit most by his death. No wonder he hated you, Dorothy. Johnny! Oh, Johnny, you can't mean you think that I would... No, no, no. I think you were only being used as a tool, Dorothy. You told me yourself how your father opposed your marrying him. 
how his only interest was in getting money for the museum. Is that true, Walter? Yes, Mr. Dollar, that is true. But if you mean to imply that I or any of us was involved in Donald's death... Walter, the more I think about it, the more I'm sure you are directly involved. Uh, Now, sit down. It's a lie. I swear to it, Mr. Dollar. You're wrong. It's a lie. We'll see about that. Because there's one thing you may have overlooked. I know what killed Donald Crump. You... you do? Oh, yes, Walter. Just as well as you do. But I don't. I... I haven't the least... Curse of Kamashek. The curse Johnny? of Kamashek. Not by a long shot. Was it, Walter? I told you, I haven't the slightest... All right, then I... tell me this. Immediately the pile of bones was found in Kamashek's tomb before anyone touched them. I refused to touch them. Be Will you listen to curse? me? Before anybody touched them, somebody sprayed those bones with a so-called preservative. And I mean so-called. Well, I don't know why you should. Oh, well, that's common practice these days, in case you don't know it, but I fail to see... What, what was supposed to be a preservative was, in reality, a deadly poison. What? Oh, come on now, Walter. But you're wrong. You must be wrong. It's impossible. You know, you're very convincing, I must admit. Well, it's true. I applied that preservative, Mr. Dollar. Oh, you did? Yes. Aqueous solution, wasn't it? Of course. And I'll bet you washed your hands very carefully immediately afterward, didn't you? Yes, of course I did, because I was told to. By whom? By... Oh, no. No. Walter? What is it? Holy... Tell me, Walter. Walter! Yes? Do you know anything about a man who tried to intercept me on my way to Egypt? To make sure I didn't get there until the bones of the pharaoh were sent to Eric Turnbull and that Donald Cronin died? No. No, I don't, believe me. Then answer me this one. Did you make up the, we'll call it, preservative that you used over there? No. Then who did? And who told you to be sure to wash your hands immediately after using it? Well? Walter! Oh, no! I'm afraid so, Dorothy. Oh, no! Better tell me, Walter. I beg your pardon, Mr. Dollar, but Mr. Harkness Sr. is here, too. Mr. Dollar, I'm Adam Harkness, curator of archaeology at the museum. Well, well, Mr. Harkness, I'm really glad to see you. Dorothy, Walter, Mr. Dollar... I've come to pick up the bones from the grave of Kamashek that I understand Donald Cronin sent to his uncle instead of to me through some misunderstanding. Oh, yeah, sure. I had a notion you'd want to pick up those bones, Dr. Harkness. And I'll give them to you on one condition. Oh? What is that? That you take them out of the package in which they arrived here with your bare hands. That you carry them out of this house also in your bare hands. Why, that's a strange... Will you? Of course not. Why? Why, because such priceless relics are too fragile, too... Too full of a deadly poison that you had them sprayed with? Curaba arsenium, I believe it's called. I don't know what you're... Walter, what have you been telling us? It's true, isn't it, Father? Well, Dr. Harkness... I don't know how you found out, Della, but I'll tell you this... You won't ever live. Wait a minute, put that thing down. Father! Wait a minute! Daddy! Johnny? (sighs) You stopped him all right, Len. But I think he'll live. Good. I knew all the police work I've been doing would come in handy sometime. Thanks for barging in at the psychological moment. I was only coming in to confirm the results of my tests. But I guess Dr. Harkness had already done it. Yeah. So, I guess the museum will profit mightily from half the insurance and all of the estate of Donald Cronin. The museum, that is, without Dr. Adam Harkness. Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, $985. Remarks? Well, doesn't mean a thing, I know, but... uh... I kind of wonder what I might have found if I'd been assigned to investigate the deaths of the people who excavated some of those other old Egyptian tombs. Tombs that had a curse on them. (laughs) Interesting thought, isn't it? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a search for $80,000 that was never there. And a body that was never there. 
Yet both of them had to be found. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in this week's cast were Paul Dubal, Alan Reed Sr., Dick Crenna, Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Forrest Lewis, Eric Snowden, Barney Phillips, James McCallion, and Les Tremaine. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. This is a serial where I actually remembered the wrong solution. I truly thought Eric Turnbull was the villain of the piece, so I was as shocked as anyone listening into this week's episode when Turnbull ended up dead. I will say Johnny's decision to release his attacker at the airport with a harsh taste of vigilante justice, leaving him in a foreign country without a passport, no less, quickly turned out to be a really bad move because he found he kind of needed him. That's why even if you're in a bind, catch and release may not be a very good tactic when attacked by criminals. Although, on the other hand, he got a good break when his friend Dr. Sinclair happened to be packing. Sinclair was able to uh, figure the things out at a record pace with great scientific knowledge while also delivering a key uh, use of a firearm. He was like Quincy, but with a concealed carry permit. I have to say that it's an interesting story in that the killer was an unseen, barely mentioned figure who didn't appear on stage until the final episode. Yet I think it mostly hangs together. And we also got to hear Les Damon, who I believe did play the villain. I mentioned when we did The Falcon that he worked both in uh, New York, where The Falcon was recorded, as well as in Hollywood. So we got to hear an example of his Hollywood work. Uh, the plan is something that our killer would have gotten away with had Johnny not been called in on the case. If the thug had been better at his job as well, Dr. Harkness could have gotten hold of the artifacts without them being uh, domestically inspected. I do wonder who would have jurisdiction over the murder. The murder occurred in Egypt, but obviously the poison was prepared and mixed by Dr. Harkness in the U.S. to kill a U.S. citizen. Thankfully for Johnny, that's all beyond his pay grade. Now, one point that's worth discussing is the seeming contradiction between what Turnbull told Johnny about uh, his finances and the evidence that Johnny seemed to find that showed Turnbull closed an investment account and a bank account, and this was never in addressed. But I don't know if it necessarily needed to be. Uh, the reality is that wealthy people, particularly if they're not living in some small town where they put all of their money in one institution, they often have really complex finances with investment and bank accounts uh, at different institutions. This is particularly true uh, because the FDIC regulation 
really limits how much of your deposit is insured at a given institution. And one way to make sure that the FDIC insures all of your deposits is to spread them out over multiple banks. He may have been closing out one bank account, and it's really not a big deal. The same thing goes for an investment account. He might have been dealing with some difficulty where he needed access to some funds he had invested, and so he closed out one of his investment accounts, but he could have had hundreds of thousands or millions in other investment accounts and been nowhere near the point of desperation of killing someone for extra money. In fact, he might have closed out both of those accounts because he heard that their employees were horrible at confidentiality and keeping his private information private. I will say, as someone who worked at a financial institution for many, many years, I cringe at the casual way that both the teller and the broker released uh, Eric Turnbull's financial information. Now, I understand that the financial industry was not nearly as regulated then as it is now. But even without regulations, that was just horrible. I mean, wow. And on one other note, it should be noted if anyone was wondering that the poison was made up by Jack Johnstone. So you don't have to wonder about it or check Wikipedia. It's not real. John Abbott noted that in his book, The Who Is Johnny Dollar Matter, and he also notes that this is the third program to mention the Studebaker Golden Hawk. It makes you wonder if Jack Johnstone owned one at the time of writing. And looking online, the Studebaker Golden Hawk is really one of those aesthetically beautiful 1950s cars. I see one that's online that's gold with white trim. Such a beautiful looking vehicle. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we start out on Facebook with a comment regarding the Crystal Lake matter. And uh, the first comment comes from Holly, who writes, The tied-up cigar wrappers were a late-breaking clue, but the real villain was given away with a slip of the tongue in the first episode. Listen carefully, and you'll hear the victim's wife going through some of her husband's documents, and at one point accidentally called him by the wrong name. Well, thanks so much. I did go ahead and re-listen to that, and I did hear her call her husband Bill when his name was actually Ed. It was so subtle, I kind of wonder whether it was an intentional clue or it was a writer's error and the actor read the script and it wasn't originally supposed to signify anything. As it is, a uh, good catch. It was a clue whether the writer meant it or not. Now we go to YouTube and Gary, who writes, Hartford, Connecticut is where my sister lives. Great content. And thank you for sharing these programs. And then we have a few comments on our listener survey. Uh, Lance writes, Adam brings great information and facts about each episode. Mike says, I've been a big fan of Adam's for over 15 years. You are an acquired taste and a great one. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate you listening over New Jersey for so long. And uh, then we have a comment from Sharon who writes, What a great show. I love to listen to these programs while I'm sewing. And she's uh, commenting from Saskatoon, and I think the SK means Saskatchewan, which I hope I pronounced in a passable way for all of our Canadian listeners. And now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Daniel. Daniel has been a Patreon supporter since March of 2020, currently supporting the podcast at the shameless level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Daniel, and that will do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software, and be sure 
to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We will be back on Tuesday with another Yours Truly Johnny Dollar serial. But join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet, where... For the past month, four nights out of five, he's been hanging around with a gang down at a soda fountain on Spring Street. He's down there as late as 2 a.m. He says he goes to the library. How do I know? I'm a busy man. Did you know that your son is mixed up with that gang? He's not mixed up with a gang. A bunch of small-time thieves, but they're growing. They started with purse snatching, breaking in parked cars, burglarizing candy stores. You don't know what you're talking about. Wait a minute, please. Then they took up robbery, stealing cars, beating up girls, women, attacking them. You're crazy. Jack's not that kind. He's part of that gang, and right now we hold all of them responsible. My boy wouldn't do anything like that. He's a member of that gang, he told us. They're the ones that knifed him tonight. That's a lie. Jack's not mixed up with anything like that. You believe anything you want, Mr. Monroe. We're going to protect your boy as much as we can, but don't expect us to raise him for you. Now, you better take a free piece of advice. You keep your advice. Jack's not in this. You can't prove he is. We're not out to prove anything right now. But you catch up with that boy of yours. Keep him off the streets before it's too late. Are you threatening me? No, sir, advising you. Next time we might meet at the morgue. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.